Jenkins version or the security team patches the stable package. But basically, you only have to do the fix once. That's the idea. So how do we leverage the work that Debian maintainers and the security team put into Debian and uh, build on top of this for our web applications? Well, that's why I want to talk to you about uh, this, pro this site that I work on called LibreAvatar.org. Now, interestingly enough, the first time I talked publicly about LibreAvatar was at DebConf 10 in New York. So it's kind of nice to be back here to talk about uh, LibreAvatar again. But basically what that site is, is that it is a federated version of Gravatar, if you know what that is. So it delivers avatars, sort of profile photos, to third-party websites. And, it's, and this one is AGPL as opposed to uh, proprietary with Gravatar. Now, this is what it looks like. So if you follow a bug uh, on the Debian BTS and you have an avatar, it will show up here right next to your name and email address. Um, so it, it does that automatically if you have one. Uh, here's another example. Mozilla Reps also uses it. So the Reps will go and upload their photos to LibreAvatar and it shows up on their site here. And this website does not have to host any of those photos. The stack for LibreAvatar is pretty simple. Apache, Django, Python, Postgres, Gearman. It's a pretty standard thing for a Django application. And the architecture is a, is a little bit special, but not very much. Uh, basically, there's a master server that is the Django application. That's where users uh, create an account and upload their photos. Then there's a bunch of mirrors that will receive the photo from the master. And then they are the ones who are actually serving it to third-party websites. Now, the thing to point out here is that the mirrors are all basically static. All, they don't have Django running. All they do is serve static file from disk. And the entire logic of the application is basically, for the serving part, is contained in, in Apache mod rewrite rules. So it's very nice, clean, and, and maintainable. Um, but it means that, uh, for example, if you'd like to volunteer a little bit of disk space and bandwidth, not very much, um, you can have your own mirror here and talk to me after, afterwards if you're interested. Uh, but basically, it's just an Apache config file uh, and a few uh, other things. For websites that want to use the service, all they have to do is follow the Gravatar protocol because um, basically I wrote a replacement for it and I decided to use the same protocol that they pioneered. And it works like this. You take the email address that the user enters, you lowercase it, you hash it, and then you turn that into our, a URL by adding the base URL in front of it. So gravatar.com slash avatar, and then the hash. And that gives you an image. So you stick that inside an image tag, and there you go. Um, so we use the same thing for LibreAvatar, except that um, it's a federated alternative to Gravatar. So we look up the base URL in DNS. So if you control a domain, say you're the owner of gmail.com, then you can uh, add this SRV record that points to avatars at gmail.com or avatars at debian.org would be a better example. And then that's the avatar server that will be used for this domain. So websites will do the, the DNS lookup and then use that as the base URL. If you don't use it uh, on your domain, like if you don't expose that DNS record, then we fall back to uh, the centralized service here, centralized fallback service. So it works for all domains, but uh, people can decide to self-host for their domain if they want to. So overall, it's a pretty simple web application, pretty simple uh, Django thing. Now, when we started the project, we decided to, um, create, to add a few roles to simplify the maintenance burden that we were gonna have running this thing. First one was only use Python packages that are packaged for Debian. So if I want to use a library, and it's not in Debian, a Python library, well, I need to find another one that is in Debian, or uh, you know, package it myself and wait until, until the next release, or something like this. Secondly, only use the version that's in uh, the latest Debian release, which means that right now, I don't use Django 1.6, which is the latest um, stable release for Django. I use 1.4, and I'll upgrade to 1.6 whenever I upgrade to Jesse. Um, so that's what it means in practice. Now, I also include backports in there since backports became official. Um, another thing to note is that in terms of deployment, 
uh, everything is done using Debian packages. Uh, so we start from kind of like an upstream make file that has a build rule that will minify the JavaScript, the CSS. It will compress it using gzip so that it's not done on the fly, but it's pre-computed. And then we compile the, the PO files as well for translations. It's got a test target that will run a bunch of linters for Python, unit tests, etc. And that creates a number of different packages. So there's a package that you install on the main application because that's the only one that uses Python, and Django, and so on. And then there's, uh, there's other packages for the mirrors that are really just Apache files and a few cron jobs. This is managed in using Repri Pro. So we've got a, a, a separate um, sort of private package repository. And um, on the computers that I manage, so a few of them, but not all of them because there's mirrors contributing, contributed by other people, uh, I use Fabric to easily keep machines kind of up to date and run commands there. For mirrors, Fabric. Fabric is a, is a neat little uh, wrapper around SSH. Basically, you can, uh, you can say, like, I want to run these commands over this class of machine. So it's kind of a very, very lightweight version of something like Salt or Ansible or whatever. Uh, but like, the comparison is not quite fair because it does very little and just runs from your own machine. Um, but if you don't want that so, sort of super heavyweight thing, you can use something like that. It's quite nice. Okay, so a Python script that runs shell commands, but some on your system, some, some on some other system. So I'll just repeat what Enrico said. A Python script that runs commands either on your machine or over SSH on a bunch of different machines. This is how you keep mirrors up to date. So basically, you do nothing else than to keep the system up to date. As long as the people that run mirrors have um, our repository in their uh, sources file, then they just need to keep their system up to date, and it'll pull in automatically the new versions of the stuff that they need to run. Yep. I will, I will get back to it. Yep. Question was, do you use unattended upgrades? And I refuse to answer now. <laughs> Okay, so how, how did it go? Because it's coming uh, very soon. Um, how did it go? Well, um, it turns out that uh, we, because of my first rule, I'm kind of limited by the choice of, of libraries that I can use. And for example, when I started this, I was running on Squeeze, and I needed to use, uh, so I chose Gearman as a queuing system, and I needed a Python library to interface with it. Now, the, the really nice one is the one at the bottom. It's a very Pythonic library. And it, you know, it's kind of what you expect from a Python library. And the top one is kind of like Python bindings for the C library. It's a little bit rough, not as pleasant to use. But it was in Debian, so that's the one I picked. Now, the, 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 the other one is actually in Wheezy now. So I could, sw I could switch. Um, but the first one kind of worked, so that was OK. Um, but in practice, it turns out it's not such a big problem. Most of the Python stuff that you want to use um, is, is in Debian, to be honest. Uh, there's quite a lot of, of, uh, of Python packages. So the, the most common libraries um, are likely to be in Debian already, um, <coughs> or in backports sometimes. The other thing is um, you can't use, that was pointed out to me, you can't actually use all the new features that are in Django 1.6, because you're in Django one, running Django 1.4, for example. And yep, that's true. Um, but I started on Django 1.2. Because that actually, I started on Django 1.0, and then eventually 1.2 made it to Squeeze. I upgraded to that. Now I'm on 1.4, and it's great. There's lots of cool 1.4 features. Um, I don't know yet what's in 1.6, so we'll see <laughs> when I upgrade. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it is a, it, it's not a big problem for me. If I were used to, to doing this, then you know it might be a problem. But um, yeah, this was a little bit scarier. The upgrade um, from Squeeze to Wheezy. Because all of a sudden, I was upgrading from major versions of Apache, I think it was 2.0 to 2.2, uh, and then Postgres, and Gearman, and uh, Django. Django was going from 1.2 to 1.4, so skipping at one full major release. Um, but it so it was kind of scary, because it was a big change. But it turned out that it was actually pretty easy. Uh, Django has really good documentation for how to move from one version to the next. And everything else in the system pretty much worked. Um, but the thing is, it's a big upgrade because you're doing, you're changing everything at once, so it's kind of a big deal. You want to put aside, set aside a little bit more time than you think you're going to need, 
Um, but it's really not that bad in practice. Uh, that's what I found. Maybe I'll change my mind when I upgrade to Jesse, but so far it's been pretty good. Um, so overall, I would say that LibreAvatar is a really low maintenance service, which is great because it's a site project, and I don't want that to, to turn into an unpaid full-time job. So, um, so it's working out really well from a maintenance point of view. Um, I have very little to do uh, in terms of maintenance. Now, here are a couple of problems that I ran into. Um, and the first one is that I obviously optimize for sysadmining this service. It's really great to sysadmin because everything is, is kind of nice, packaged, and it, it gets updated automatically. But I did not optimize at all for developers. So it's a little bit tricky to get a development environment running, for example, because I fully take advantage of, of the fact that I'm running in Debian. I have cron jobs all over the place, shell scripts that do all sorts of things. I use different users for, to sort of limit the, the, the potential. Uh, so for the things that run as root, you know, they're really small scripts, and then I've got different users to sort of limit privileges. So it's kind of a pain in the ass to, to get all of this running. Um, it's documented, but, um, but it's, it's kind of a barrier for new developers. It prevents sort of drive-by contributions. Um, what I've started to do um, is, to, is to turn my instructions into a script, a vagrant script, that new contributors will be able to run. Um, Ashish uh, raves about vagrant, and, uh, and, and uh, he's convinced me that, uh, that that should fix the problem. But, uh, but basically, when you optimize for sysadmining, you get something that's quite hard for developers, so you have to think about something else to make it easy for people to contribute to your project. The other problem is that, that I ran into is that um, if, you, if you depend on something from the system, like a system package, um, then you're going to be exposed to their bugs. And for example, uh, jQuery, so this is libgs-jQuery, um, had a bug where uh, someone discovered, I think it was between Squeeze and Wheezy, that we were shipping a minified, uh, a copy, a minified copy of jQuery that was, that was <coughs> compiled by upstream into Debian without rebuilding it ourselves. So that's, of course, an RC bug because we're not building from source and could be, who knows who could be in, what could be in there. Um, and so it was removed before Wheezy. So w in the Wheezy version of that package, uh, there's just two copies of the real source file. And so that means that all of my users are getting the full version of jQuery, uh, which is not ideal, uh, but because I'm relying on that system package as a dependency. I have no way of, of actually minifying it myself because the minification happens in my build step for my package and jQuery is pulled in at install time. So I can't actually touch it. So the way to fix it would be to either backport, do, do a backport where I revert that change, stick that into my own repository, or uh, to actually fix the bug in Debian and, and then get, in, get it pushed out in time. Now this is fixed in Jesse. Uh, but it's just an example of how you could be affected by a bug in Debian, basically. So you want to, to uh, keep an eye on the dependencies in Debian to make sure that you're not going to run into something major. So this is a slide for, uh, for the, uh, that I made for Zach. Um, we agreed upon it. It turns out that, um, so unattended upgrades, for those who don't know, is basically a package that will run app get update, app get upgrade all the time. So if you, um, so some people may think that that's not a good thing, you should actually log into your box to keep it up to date. Um, but the reality is that, you know, if, if you have lots of servers, not much time to maintain it, it's much better to run something like this than to not upgrade and be running a bunch of exploitable shit all the time. <laughs> so, uh, so unattended upgrades is great, but the thing is Django has a habit of sometimes having um, security fixes that actually remove features because they're like, they're, they're, there's no way to make them secure. Um, you run into deaths, right? <laughs> so so you can't just, you can't just like automatically install the, packet, the, new, the latest package that Luke pushed because it might actually break yourself. You have to like read the change log and, uh, and or go, go take a look at the, um, the advisories that, that Django released to make sure that you're not using one of those features in one of the ways, usually they don't remove the whole feature, but they'll disable part of a feature or something like that. Um, so 
<laughs> yes, hopefully it will make it to the, to the news section uh, for the package. But basically, you can't just blindly apply updates for Django. You have to, uh, you have to test it uh, before you go. Yep. So I think about breaks that, Did someone think about uh, using breaks? Um, I don't know. You'd I mean, that's a lot of work, but you might just break the current portions. Would you use that if that isn't particularly secure? So can we, can we add that to breaks to, to sort of indicate that something bad might happen? It's kind of tricky because the, the feature is exploitable on your server, so, so it's, it's kind of broken in a different way. Um, <laughs> so it, it's not clear what the right answer is. Uh, well, actually, so, so the right answer for me is that I use Aptcron instead of unintended upgrades. And that's, uh, and that's a package that will, that's, that's an email that I will send you. Um, whenever it detects that there's a package that needs to be updated and hasn't been, it will email you. So every day until you actually fix it. Um, and so that, that works quite well. You, at least you get a notification that you need to go in, update the package, test it, and then, um, you know, be happy. Um, another thing that was pointed out to me is that sometimes security updates are not always timely in Debian. Now, that's not, that's not to criticize Luke or anybody else that maintains one of, uh, one of my dependencies. Um, but sometimes, you know, like there's lots of vulnerable stuff in the archive, and it takes time to go around and fix them all. And, uh, and so it, it can be, uh, you know, sometimes it will be a couple of days and sometimes weeks, uh, especially if, if nobody notices, uh, before the Debian package is updated. Now, there's kind of two cases. The first one is that you actually notice that the package is out of date in Debian and there's been a security fix upstream. Um, and, and you may notice because you're already following the RSS feed from upstream or you know, their security newsletter or something like that. In which case, you can help out with backporting the fix or you know, testing the fix. Because sometimes, for some of these things, um, the security team, uh, for them, it's actually pretty hard to, to just go and, and, and fix a web application if they don't know how people use it, right? If it's like a web framework or something like that, and they don't have an easy way of testing it, then uh, just, just offering to, to test it, to test their, their, their package would be a really good thing. Um, but, and also, if you end up like hacking a fix on your own machine, why not you know, submit that fix to Debian? So that's, the, so that's if you do notice, that's what I would say. If you don't notice, right, because you can't possibly keep track of the 250 dependencies that I showed you on, my, on, on one of my first slides. Well, then it's better late than never, right? Um, if you can't keep up with all the upstream things that you have, or they don't all have security mailing lists or RSS feeds or whatever, then it's much better to rely on system packages because it only takes a single Debian user to file a security bug for, for Debian to actually start the process of fixing it. So this is another problem. Um, the approach that I took uh, is kind of different from the recommended approach uh, that web developers um, have nowadays, which is basically to push all your stuff to GitHub, have a bunch of proprietary services, connect to it, do all sorts of things, and test it, and commit to it, and whatever, take your code and push it to your server for you. Um, I don't know how to fix that problem. I don't see it as a problem myself. But it is kind of weird to describe that approach to other people. Um, something to keep in mind. Um, <coughs> finally, another thing that I ran into is that uh, LibreRTR has actually been picked up by a couple of community sites on the Fedora side. And that made me realize that the fact that Debian is such a central component of the whole infrastructure is a would be a little bit of a problem if a Fedora person came up to me and said, hey, I'd like to run a mirror. Can I help? Because uh, I would be like, oh, I have to build an RPM for you now. <laughs> Which, you know, I, I'm, I'm willing to do uh, if I have, like, a real offer for that. I'm not going to do it for fun. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, like, when you rely on system, uh, on, on system things like this, you are a little bit locked into Debian. Um, which might be good for you, but uh, in general. So is this approach realistic? Or am I just crazy and, uh, you know, I'm big, because I'm basically ignoring conventional wisdom, conventional web dev wisdom. Well, it turns out that a few hours after this blog post got published, so when they announced the first batch of, of talks that were accepted at DevConf, um, I got an email from a guy who runs uh, these services. SkyDNS is a Russian service, and SafeDNS is the American equivalent. And uh, what was really interesting about um, that email is that 
this guy has exactly the same approach as I picked on LibreAvatar, and we never talked to each other before. He runs Django using Luke's package. All of the, si uh, the dependencies are system libraries, and he even packages the whole thing using devs. And this is a real uh, commercial uh, website with paying customers and everything. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, I, I realize that's anecdotal evidence, but there's at least two of us that are doing it that way. <laughs> yes. Three. Three. Oh, there we go. Four. Four. Oh. <coughs> All right. The, the, the anecdotal evidence is piling up. <laughs> <laughs> so what would be a good fit for that uh, kind of approach? Well, I think if, it's, if the site you're working on is not your full-time job, like it's a side project like Libratar is for me, that's really good because it reduces your maintenance burden and you don't want... You know, like maintain, maintaining a service is is kind of boring, um, and if you if you're doing something for fun, you don't want you don't want to spend all your time doing the stuff that's not fun, right? You want to do development or make the service better or something like this. You do, you don't want to just you know keep up re read like announced lists for dependencies and keep stuff up to date. Um, so that would be the, my first sort of criterion. The second thing is I would say. Um, if you want to use something like this, make sure that you're using a mature framework. Um, because, for example, until recently, if you were using Node.js, you probably didn't want to run the Debian packages for them. You probably wanted to go and get it from source or, you know, like cat, uh, like wget the script into, uh, into sudo bash or something <laughs> like this, um, as recommended. Uh, but, uh, but basically, if you got the, the Debian packages, it was too old. It was like, uh, like two versions ago of Node.js, and it changed so much that nothing would work. Um, Django is actually really quite good for that. Um, it does, like, when you upgrade, I'm sure when I upgrade from 1.4 to 1.6, uh, it's not going to take me three days to, uh, to actually figure out. Um, so yeah, side project is a really good example of something that I think works well with this. But the other one is um, related to what I used to do uh, b before my current job, which I was working for uh, Catalyst, one of the sponsors, this year's DevConf. And they're a consulting company, and they run um, lots of small websites for lots of clients, and, and lots of large websites as well. Um, but the, the small client website kind of example is a really good one, because you don't want to spend much time working on their sites, because they don't have that much money, and they don't want to pay for stuff that's not visible, like security updates and things like that. So you want to minimize the amount of work that you'll have to do there. And if you have to deal with completely different code bases all the time, different versions of dependencies, it becomes a nightmare really quickly. So I think it's, it's worthwhile to, uh, to do something like this. But whatever you do, remember this horrible list. And also remember that when you're bundling code inside your own application, you become responsible for them, right? If there's a security vulnerability in any of this stuff, like, we have to issue a new version of our application and deal with it. So pick the approach that you want, but I think it's worth considering the approach of limiting your options to, to um, sort of help out, uh, help reduce the, the, the maintenance burden. Are there any questions? Yes, Enrico. Yay, it's on. First of all, thank you. Uh, I subscribe to everything you said. I work in exactly the same way. It pays my bills. It makes me happy. I wrote a blog post about it that hit Planet Debian some time ago called Deb Ops. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> cool. uh, which uh, I think is a good summary of uh, the same uh, idea and uh, uh, one of one of the companies I work for uh, is a services company that maintains about, uh, uh, we have more than 10 websites deployed and we keep making new ones, all for small customers. And if we started to maintain the whole jumble of dependencies embedded in each and every single one of them, uh, we'd be dead by now because we'd be like, I don't know, some spam repeaters for, for something. So we need to cut on, well, we can't afford to have dedicated sysadmins, one for each application. And one application could be application serving game, uh, lang language learning games for uh, Italian-speaking schools in the German-speaking part of Italy. 
right. which can't afford a dedicated sysadmin. So it's definitely cost effective. Uh, development wise, as long as the developers know and are sane, it's not a big deal because that's part of the specifications. Um, and a uh, developer that can't read specifications is not worth it, that name, in my opinion. <laughs> um, it helps if upstream has some release policy. So yes, doable in Django. Uh, no, not doable in Turbo Gears. Thank God that died. Um, and uh, we use backports a bit more. We're already on Django 1.6. That's in backports. It helps to reduce the size of upgrade jumps. Right. And it's good that the uh, Python Django idea. maintainers are doing an excellent job of maintaining it also on backports. Uh, so hands up. Yes, thank you, Luke. <laughs> <laughs> and for scripting uh, maintenance things, I've written a Django app called Django Housekeeping. That's currently in Debian, although uh, testing, I think. So not stable, okay. not backports. Sorry. <laughs> um, which allows every Django application to create management tasks that are, are run nightly. And that simplifies a lot all deployment because then you just schedule one cron job and uh, applications can do their, their own checks, backups, okay. uh, housekeeping. And sends nice report. And <laughs> <laughs> cool. What is it called again? Uh, Django Housekeeping. Django Housekeeping. All right. Coming soon in Jesse. So I'm currently upstream of a web app, which is Deb Sources. I think I know my way around Python packaging, even though I've been doing that in a while. And I wrote the tutorial on how to maintain me, mini the install installation on, uh, on people Debian org. But still, I find, that I find that the scaffolding for doing all the automatic deployment as Debian packages is kind of very heavyweight. So right now, Deb Sources is deployed from the checkout of some specific deployment branch of the uh, of, the, of the upstream Git repo on the machine. So I wonder if you have suggestions based on your experience on how we can make it easier to have make targets to just create Debian packages, push them to some uh, repository somewhere, and avoid that everyone which have to which have to be at the at DevOps essentially rewrite his own scripts and rather ad hoc. Yeah, uh, I've got my own, that's cool. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, I, that, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. Um, I don't have a solution to it, but like, yeah, I, I mean, I, in my make file, that's, that's where my packages get built, and, and like, uh, you know, I run dpackage at some point, uh, dpackage build package at some point in there, um, and then I use, um, I use Fabric to easily sort of, to update my, my, my repo. Uh, sign everything and then actually SSH into the machines and install it. So Is there something that could, I, could be factorized and shared with others? Or? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I would have to look. I mean, I, I can show you what, I, what I'm doing and maybe you'll, you'd have ideas on how, how much of, of it you could use and then maybe that would help us decide whether or not there's things that, parts that we can split out. Yeah. So um, I'm not a web developer, but some of my best friends are. Uh, and uh, at work, I'm responsible for the sort of sysadmin side of some web apps. And the, so we have this sort of discussion within the team where the web developers always want the latest version of everything, and I'm very lazy. So I don't want, you know, I don't want to end up having to maintain all these packages myself. So the compromise we tend to come to is we, if there are things that are in Debian and we need a newer version, I'll make a backport. And then for new bits of Django, because it's usually Django we use, I make some of my own packages and maybe I'll push them into new when I've got a bit more time. And that sort of works for us because it means hopefully, again, we're outsourcing as much of this effort to Debian and not doing it all in-house. Um, and we can contribute to Debian because we increase the set of Django libraries that are in Debian, um, but we still get enough of the update <laughs> stuff that my web dev colleagues are happy. Right. Um, and we do packaging for everything except the actual app itself, which we okay. um, use Ansible to push out from a Git repository. Um, and so, yeah, that's a sort of compromise between we'll only do things that are in stable and we'll just download any old junk of the internet. And that, that, that kind of works for us. Yeah, that's, I think that's an excellent point. You don't have to go all the way necessarily. I mean, I went all the way because I'm the sysadmin for, for that service and I want to minimize that as much as possible. And, and you know, 
that's the compromise. That, that's the trade-off that I made there. But if you if you have more people on your team, you can afford a little bit more maintenance. Then you can actually have a sort of hybrid approach where you you rely on Debian as much as possible, but then you backboard a few things. And, Well, I, I'll also just uh, comment on a, sim a similar use case, not exactly the same, because you are all doing uh, development and just integrating the bits that are already done. But, uh, well, I ended up uh, adopting uh, Drupal uh, because, uh, well, I have several Drupal sites at my university. And uh, and I built uh, DH make Drupal that, uh, well, allows me to uh, convert any uh, Drupal module into a Debian package. Of course, at the beginning, uh, some people, me included, uploaded some of those modules to Debian. In the end, we decided, uh, well, not to, because the, the quality of the modules is not uh, homogeneous. Uh, but, well, yeah, I mean, we, we of course, I have a, a huge uh, repository of all the modules I've ever used. And, uh, even I can tell you it's a very dirty app repository because I don't purge the old versions. They're just piling up there and, uh, well, taking uh, space. But, of course, also the DH make Drupal uh, is written in Ruby because I would not be able to stand it written in PHP. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, yeah, it, it's a huge time saver for us. Yeah, and and the, the the interesting thing there is that you you said you picked up the the maintenance of Drupal because you were kind of doing that work already, uh, at you know as part of your of your work, and uh, and that's this a similar story to what Luke was telling me. Um, he he was using Django in his uh, previous company, and they were using like system libraries and stuff. So, might as well maintain it for everyone in Debian. Um, I'm sorry if I missed the, some of this answer at the beginning of the talk, uh, but how, if at all, do you pass configuration information to the web app, and is that like something you store in DebConf, like the database URL? Um, I also noticed that you said that it's hard to live in a world of unattended upgrades. Perhaps what that means is it should be easier in, the, in your deployment plan to have a staging site, and then you have a separate VM that does the unattended upgrade. You send n percent of the traffic there if it crashes you don't send traffic there. I wonder if you've thought about that basically also. Yeah, so uh, so, so the, the the answer to your first question is yes, I use DevConf. That's where I put all of the stuff. So when I upgrade, if there's no if, if you know there's no extra questions then then nothing happens. Um, in terms of uh, uh, having a staging site, run unattended upgrades and then maybe like run the, the full regression test suite. Um, that would be great if I had a regression test suite. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it's, it's more, I, I have some tests, but it's mostly manual testing for a lot of it. So um, yeah, I think that uh, uh, it, it would only be possible. Like, there's not much point in me doing unattended upgrades if I'm then doing manual testing to verify that it worked. So. I mean, just to respond to that briefly. Um, one thing you could do is do the unattended upgrade on a different VM, send n percent, 10 percent of the traffic there. And if the mm. error log has new exceptions, uh, or rather, if the error log is non-zero at all, uh, undo that. Yeah, so to outsource your testing to your live users. Yes. How would you plan out? So I'm upstream for Nosfer, which is a social networking platform. Okay. Within Ruby and Rails, and we, we have all the same issues, so we target also target Wheezy, or better, the latest Debian stable. And now we also have the problem of upgrading from one version of Rails to the next one, as much painful as for Django. And then that was just to share my, my pain with you. <laughs> and then uh, on the GitHub issue and on the opinion on proprietary services, something that works. Uh, for me, at least, is using GitLab, which is free software and has everything you need. You need from GitHub, like uh, visibility for the repository, and issue tracking system, and uh, merge requests, and all the stuff. And it's there's a slight chance that's going to be in Debian for Jesse, but I oh, nice. I wouldn't count on it. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to mention that uh, uh, the, the web devs I know uh, often run into the situation of 
um, something running something like WordPress and having a bunch of uh, like looking at some of the plugins and some of which are proprietary and uh, using the Ar the Debian archive to actually build your web your web app has the benefit of actually being compliant with the Debian free software guidelines so that now you know you can actually deploy this and not have to worry as much about licensing at least you know that's that's what I would assume right Hi, um, anecdotally, uh, I'm not a web app developer, but when I do develop web apps, this is more or less the, uh, the same workflow that I use. Um, uh, so my question is, um, on one of your slides, you, you recommend to use a mature framework, and you sort of also imply that you should also use a mature language, and you show uh, yeah, app cache search results for Python, you know, X many thousands of packages or modules packaged in Debian. Um, I was wondering what you or anyone else in the room uh, thinks about um, newer, you know, less mature languages that have a more uh, uh, more aggressive, more uh, tightly integrated um, uh, language-specific package manager, you know, such as the Go friendly language. Yeah, so I mean, I can comment on, on Node.js because I was working on a Node.js application. I looked at whether or not I could use the same approach there, and there was not enough stuff in the archive. Uh, I would have had to use NPM to install almost everything anyways, and uh, at the time when I looked, and also the Node.js itself was, was not the right version. Uh, it, you know, the version that was in Debian was, was kind of broken in lots of ways um, because it was, it was a little bit early. Um, so I suspect that the, the, the younger languages will, will have these sorts of problems. So it's probably not a good approach for those ones. Um, but if, uh, if some parts of your infrastructure are not as mature, say like the framework is not that mature, then you can, maybe you can still rely on, on you know, the, the Python libraries for other stuff. Or like you can have kind of a hybrid approach if, if not everything is mature. But sometimes mixing things is a bit hard as well. Right. I, I noticed on your your Node.js uh, slide that your packages had uh, version numbers, mm -hmm. and and in some cases these newer uh, programming languages uh, don't have those. You're either uh, specifying a particular git commit or even just saying, "Hey, pull whatever uh, is on the is on head or whatever." Yeah, and hope for the best. And so, are, are we regressing in, in this aspect? Well, so those things of like, I depend on like any version of this library, like tend not to work very well because like if you if you try to N npm install it again, it will be totally different and pro probably broken if if you know it's a new major version of it. So what I see a lot of web developers use is just hard code the exact versions that they want. Um, and you missed the example from Open Hatch earlier yeah. of, the, of your vendor directory. Oh yeah, it's amazing. Uh, I started with that, uh, but uh, the vendor directory is the same thing. You basically hard code, hard code specific versions of, of, uh, of packages. So, I think that's the common pattern. So it's not really an issue of like you know later it will break. It will always work, but uh, but you know I might have vulnerable versions of things. This is a, a sort of discussion that I've heard repeatedly throughout this DevConf. We had it in the Java BOF. Um, we had it with the Haskell team the other day about how you deal with this sort of infrastructure that's growing up where people don't want to use a distribution and they said they'll just throw random versions or whatever junk happened to be handy when they were writing their app together and then the result is a maintenance nightmare and I, as a, I am a primarily as a sysadmin you know this sort of thing gets me really irate because you know you write it once and then it gets hacked and you're like well where did this library come from oh it was depending <coughs> on by that thing and it was just some random version and there's no stable API um, and I'm not quite sure so far we haven't seemed to come to a good answer particularly if we take the approach of well this is like how the Node.js infrastructure works so if you're going to do that on Debian then just download everything from Node.js we never get to the point where um, like the state we have with Django, where there's enough of Django in Debian that using it on mm -hmm. Debian becomes um, practical. So there's, there's a risk of a kind of vicious circle there. Uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure what the answer is, but just this is a, seems to be a common pattern that I've observed throughout this week. So. I, I wonder if ignoring the first, you know, 
year or two of a, of a new framework is, is, is the solution. Because like Node.js is, is starting to stabilize now. So, you know. Over a decade, yes. Um, yeah, I like to think that uh, th those pioneering things are good for a job in a startup where I build a new website and then change job. <laughs> uh, yes, someone else's but problem. But then I think a good way to start is that we are here all saying, yes, I do that. Yes, that makes sense. Uh, because the world is full of people that told me, oh, you should use virtual AMP. And I told them things that I should not repeat because of the code of conduct of the conference. <laughs> um, but uh, I've been like in IRC channels where I look like the weirdo out there. Yeah. And uh, what then I told myself, I'm probably the only one that has a job in here. <laughs> uh, but uh, sort of like uh, the, 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 the distribution pride, if you want, but coming out and saying, I'm, I'm doing this, it makes a lot of sense to me. It's something you should consider uh, as long as you want to develop something that's maintainable over time and not just build it, the thing, put it out there, say I've done it, yep. and move to something else. And I hope to get acquired quickly. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't have to maintain it very long. Yeah. Anyways, I think that was all the time that we had. So thank you very much. Ooh.